Bible Alive, Bible Basics, class number five. Why bother with the Bible? Part two. The following presentation would be impossible without these resources, especially 101 questions and answers on the Bible by Father Raymond E. Brown. Let's continue. If Raymond Brown were asked to elaborate more on what he means by saying the Bible is a library, he would say that when we speak of the Bible in the singular, as if it were one book, we're paying tribute to its divine origins. Nevertheless, the Bible is a collection of some 70 books. In the Big C Catholic Estimation, 73. In the Protestant Estimation, 66 books. But that isn't the only way we think of the Bible as a library. In fact, more importantly, thinking of the Bible as a library is better served by understanding that it has many different literary genres, not only books of different literary genres, but also even in singular books of the Bible, we have different genres at work. And these literary genres were written at different times and in different places. The Second Vatican Council's Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation number 12 says, those who search out the intention of the sacred writers must, among other things, have regard for their literary forms. Literary forms, or genres. The Council Fathers single out some common literary forms in the Bible. History of one kind or another. Prophecy. Poetry. Some other kind of speech. Let's explore these literary forms or genres a bit within the Old Testament. History of one kind or another. When we compare Second Samuel chapter 24 with First Chronicles chapter 21, we see two very different takes on King David. But in both of these accounts, we see David taking a census. And yet both accounts give two different answers to the question, who inspired David to take a census? One of these answers makes King David look good. The other answer makes King David look very bad. Do these books, Samuel and Chronicles, then represent two different kinds of history? Certainly we would not call this history in our 21st century Western use of the word. If we compare 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 1 Chronicles chapter 20, we may ask, Hey, what happened to Bathsheba in Chronicles? She's mentioned in 2 Samuel. But in Chronicles, she's not mentioned. What gives? Bathsheba is so central to the story in Samuel. How can she just disappear or be ignored in Chronicles? Relative to the Bathsheba incident, does Chronicles seem to whitewash King David's life story? We might also ask, how does the so-called history of Sirach, chapter 47, which praises King David, compare with the so-called history of 2 Samuel and the so-called history of 1 Chronicles? We see that 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Chronicles and Sirach chapters 44 through 49 are three different kinds of so-called history concerning essentially the same events the same historical character. Later on in this playlist, we will return to a consideration of such so-called histories. But for now, I want you to note the variety of interpretations given to the same historical persons and events in different parts of the Bible. And then we have prophecy in the Bible, another kind of literary genre. When you read any of the prophets, for example, Amos chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, verses 6 to 8. Note carefully the literary form or genre of prophetic speech and what it looks like. In this culture, we think of prophet and prophecy like something related to Nostradamus or Edgar Cayce or some psychic predicting the future ahead of time. Is that what Amos chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 and verses 6 to 8 look like? How does prophetic speech usually begin? Is the message of the prophet good news or bad news? 
Is there a discernible pattern to biblical prophecy? The Bible is littered with poetry. When you read a sample of the Psalms, do verses sometimes seem repetitious? Do they offer contrasts? Do verses rhyme, like in many forms of English poetry? We should observe very carefully the poetry in the Bible. The poetry in the Bible reflects Mediterranean culture and its norms and values. In the Mediterranean, there is a poetry that is proper to men, and there is a poetry proper to women. The poetry of the Psalms, does it reflect poetry for women or poetry for men? What do you know about the norms and values the Mediterranean world and the Middle Eastern world associate with men and women so that you can decide if the Psalms are male or female poetry? Perhaps the first Old Testament books took shape 800 to 700 years before Christ, even though some of the traditions that are preserved in them were written hundreds of years earlier. The last New Testament book to be written was probably written in the early 2nd century. That is why people tend to estimate that it took about a thousand years to write the Bible. In this period of time, biblical authors would have been facing very different problems and would represent different stages of theological perception that would condition the way in which they reported God's revelation. We should not assume that the human author of any book of the Bible saw the whole issue he was reporting and commenting on. The part of the issue that was seen by him was shaped by what would be of help to his contemporaries. The idea that God was speaking through the human author, meaning communicating, disclosing, does not remove that human limitation, that limitation of perspective. Because God always deals with people as they are and respects their humanity. Now we might ask, what practical effects result from considering the Bible as a collection of books in a library rather than as one singular literary work or book? Well, here terminology has great practical effects. When somebody comes up to you and states, the Bible says this, your first response should be, which book of the Bible? On a given topic, one can have biblical authors responding very differently to the same issue. In fact, one of the worst expressions that's so popular among Christians is, the Bible says, dot, dot, dot. A word of advice? Never say that. Never say the Bible says, dot, dot, dot. Moreover, an approach to the Bible as a library affects the expectation of the readers as they open the pages of a particular author. In a modern library, books are on the shelf according to their subject matter. There is a section for history, a section for biography, a section for novels, for drama, for poetry, etc. If you were to walk into a library and ask for a book, the first question from the librarian would be, well, what kind of book? That also is very important to ask in reading the Bible. What kind of book am I reading here? Some of the most serious mistakes of biblical interpretation have flowed from an assumption, quite unwarranted, that all the books of the Bible are history. Today, books have dust jackets that tell the reader the genre or literary form of a book that you're reading, and readers automatically adjust their mindset to an expectation in light of that information. I mean, you wouldn't read The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, thinking it's a real history of a real place, would you? And no one picks up a Sherlock Holmes story and expects to read accurate history of an actual historical person who lived in London at the end of the last century. The biblical books do not come with dust jackets, however, and an important task of biblical scholarship is to supply an introduction to each book that helps us to identify what kind of literature it is. People have wasted lots of time measuring fish gullets in order to prove the historicity of the book of Jonah. 
a scholarly introduction that tells the reader that the book of Jonah is a parable and not history saves a good deal of human confusion. Now, if you're thinking, oh my God, all of this is telling me that we no longer believe in the inspiration of the Bible, I have to make even more clarifications. Certainly we believe, as Catholics and other Christians, in the inspiration of the Bible. Most scholarly conservative Bible scholars would not reject the terminology, the Bible is inspired, provided its implications are understood correctly. If this question is in your minds after I explain that there are books of different kinds of genres in the Bible, would suggest to me that you're not very clear on what inspiration means. You may still think it means dictation. And you may still think it means everything in the Bible is factual. Inspiration does not mean dictation, and it does not demand that everything in the Bible reported is factual. Often it is thought that inspiration makes everything in the Bible into historical facts. It does not. You could have inspired poetry, inspired drama, inspired legend, inspired myth, and yes, inspired fiction, and on and on. If the book of Jonah is a parable and not history, then God's inspiration of it makes it an inspired parable. The truth that it conveys about God's desire that all nations have metanoia and recognition of God's name and to a moral way of life that will bring them happiness is a truth that we can accept as God's inspired word for us. Inspiration does not mean that we have to believe that a historical figure named Jonah was swallowed up by a large fish or marine mammal. We would have to deal with the factuality of that only if the book of Jonah were inspired history, which it is not. It's inspired, but it's not inspired history. Similarly, if the first chapters of Genesis are not classified in the branch of the library called science, but in the branch of the library called myth and religious lore and legend, we would still accept the creation of the world by God as the inspired truth conveyed by those chapters. But we would not, however, have to accept the Genesis description as a scientific account of the origins of the world. It could be an account that the author, many centuries, many thousands of years ago, learned from the legendary imaginings of his people and of other peoples, and that he used these to convey the truth that he was really interested in, namely that God, the God of Israel, is sovereign of all and creator of the universe. Thus there would be no contradiction between acceptance of inspiration and acceptance of different literary genres or literary forms or literary styles in the Bible.